Hi, and welcome to the Five Minute Check In. So, I'm very excited today. We're covering two topics that are getting a lot of press these days. Number one is the FDA took a look at phenylephrine, which is used in a lot of over counter medications. And number two, a really interesting article that was published looking at the impact of caffeine on arrhythmias. And to help me in that conversation today, very happy to have Dr. Kavita Chavla with me, who is a faculty at the Virginia Mason Franciscan Training Program and a busy, busy primary care physician. Kavita, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Tom. So why don't we jump right in? I thought this was so interesting that the FDA decided to take a look at phenylephrine, which as we all know, is used in a lot of the -the over-the-counter medications. For me, I wasn't surprised that it doesn't work because, you know, I I have no assumptions that many of the over-the-counter medications have any real evidence behind them. What was really surprising to me is that the FDA took a look. So, you know, you're a busy practicing physician, you're an educator, you know, tell me about, uh, you know, what, what does this mean? Yeah, so it's really interesting, right, that they took on phenylephrine of all the -the over-the-counter substances. And um, this is not news for most practicing providers, right? um, Even if you look at the FDA um, data, they initially received comments to reconsider phenylephrine more than a decade ago. And so, yeah, so what the panel is considering is banning this ingredient, phenylephrine, which is found in many over-the-counter cold medicines. Um, Some popular brands that uh, patients know are the Sudafed PE, NyQuil, Mucinex, Benadryl cold and flu. So not very surprising. I guess a lot of people, so I guess part of the question would be, you know, what are we going to have our physicians discuss with their patients around all these things, clean out your cabinet, toss it away. Um, or, and, and what, what might we steer people to use for, you know, more impactful over the counter medications? Yeah. Thank goodness we have better options. So, um, we, it'll be a few decisions before a final decision is made by the FDA. Um, but odds are phenylephrine is on its way out. Um, but calling out a few things. So, This only applies to oral phenylephrine, not the nasal spray phenylephrine, right? Um, And note that FDA is just saying that phenylephrine is not effective, not that it's dangerous. So patients don't need to grab it and throw it out, right? Right, right, right. I think that's a very good point. Yeah. Yeah, it's usually part of certain combinations. So like there's probably Tylenol or something else in there that'll probably help them feel a little bit better. And so alternatives, which are better. Uh, There is behind the counter Sudafed or Pseudofedrin is the active ingredient. Um, That's the one where you kind of have to put in your name, date of birth, sign your first child away to the pharmacy in order to get the Pseudofedrin. Um, That one works. Um, It works quite well for nasal congestion, but it can also cause side effects like insomnia, high blood pressure, some jitteriness, things like that. So really for my patients with sinus or nasal congestion for national guidelines, I always emphasize that the most effective treatment is sinus irrigation with mm-hmm. Medipod or a sinus rinse kit followed by intranasal decongestants like oxymetazoline or um, intranasal steroids to reduce that sinus inflammation. So just give yeah, yeah. localized treatment for a localized problem. So maybe this will help people, you know, focus on more impactful treatments. Uh, this whole conversation, I, I think people are less, they don't enjoy the, you know, this, all the sprays that go up there, but I think it is the better way to go if you're really going to take a medication. So let, let's let switch. Um, the other publication that came out and it was called the Crave Coffee in Real-Time Atrial and Ventricular Ectopy. Um, and, you know, cardiology always knows how to make a good acronym when they do a study. <laughs> Uh, you know, fascinating study uh, and the way they designed the trial. So we'll talk a little bit about that and maybe a little bit about, well, you know, what are the implications of this? It's a small trial, but interesting trial. So tell us a little bit about this trial. Sure, exactly. Like you said, small study, 100 participants. It's a study out of UCSF and it was funded by NIH. So no coffee uh, hawkers backing the study. <laughs> no coffee influence there, yeah. <laughs> it's... um. It's interesting because it's a case crossover study. So simplistically, that means that each of the participants served as their own control. Um, It was also a short study. So it was just over 14 days. Um, Most 
participants were relatively young, more than 80% were under the age of 50, um, and no um, cardiac arrhythmias, no cardiac issues, those were all exclusionary criteria. Pretty healthy group they looked at, really. Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, they did, uh, it was a relatively diverse population, so 51% were women, 51% were non-white populations, so that's good. Um, and so these 100 participants were randomly assigned to consume caffeinated coffee or no coffee uh, during two day periods. So mm. effectively over a 14 day interval, you had seven cycles of being on coffee or being off coffee. Mm. Um, but what's particularly remarkable about the design of this study is the use of technology. It was so fun to go through this. So their primary outcome was the mean number of premature atrial contractions or PACs every 24 hours. And so the way they measured that is each participant was fitted with a cardiac monitor, a CO patch in this case, um, to continuously monitor their heart rhythm in that 14 day interval. And every time they consumed coffee, they were to press a button on the monitor to kind of timestamp that coffee consumption. Um, secondary outcomes were PVCs or premature ventricular contractions, again, measured through the Zeo patch. Each participant got a wearable device to measure their sleep and their step count. Um, they all got swabbed for DNA to assess whether they were hmm. fast, intermediate, or slow caffeine metabolizers. All I, love, I love that whole, yeah, that's a whole <laughs> new world of, of thought on caffeine. Are you a fast metabolizer or not? Uh, Isn't amazing, it? Really. And then uh, one of the most fun parts for me was they used geofencing. So basically an app on the participant's phone to check when they visited their local coffee shops to kind of make sure that they were staying true to, to their assignment. Wow. Yeah. It's, you know, so many data points, so many interesting ways of do it. I think to me, that's almost the, the most, as you, you and I have discussed this, that's almost the yeah. most interesting part of the trial. Um, so let's just focus on the main results. Mm -hmm. I think there, you know, there was the arrhythmia ones and there was the whole thing with sleep and steps, which was another fascinating outcome. But let, let's focus on, on some of the impacts on PACs and PVCs. Certainly. So um, PACs were chosen by the authors as the primary outcome and they found there's no uh, significant difference in the rate of PACs between days when they consumed coffee versus days didn't they did not. Um, however, for PVCs, there was a 50% increase in the rate of PVCs on days when they consumed coffee versus not. Hmm. Now, why the authors use PVCs as a secondary outcome versus a primary outcome, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, we um, talked about this. It's a little confusing. Um, yeah. They really focus on their conclusions on the PACs, but um, it, it it seemed pretty impactful on PVCs. So right. interesting. About it. And the other one was this sleep versus uh, exercise that, yeah. that, that was interesting. Tell us about that. Yeah. So interestingly... Not surprisingly, I guess, um, caffeine consumption days were associated with less sleep and more steps on that day. But what's really fascinating is they drilled down in this, again, small sample size of 100 uh, participants, and they concluded that for every cup of coffee consumed, it resulted on average about 500 more steps per day and 14 minutes less sleep per day. So you get 500 steps, but you lose 15 minutes sleep. It's It was just sort of an interesting, I've never yeah. quite felt like that before. So so what would be your take home on this study for practical purposes? They may, may be none, they may be just future research has to happen or in, any, any final take homes? Yeah, so I, I think to your point, right? How generalizable is this study? Because it is young, healthy individuals. It's a small study, um, so maybe not terribly so. But I would take away the fact that you know a fifty percent increase in PVCs—that's remarkable, mm -hmm. and also so interesting that um, those who are fast metabolizers tended to get more PVCs, versus those who are slow metabolizers tended to have more trouble with sleep. So don't mm -hmm. compare your caffeine uh, tolerance with someone else. Maybe just enjoy a little cup of chai instead and <laughs> okay not to have coffee. Exactly. Well, listen, thanks so much, Dr. Chabla, for joining us and, and, and reviewing these two very interesting uh, you know, trends that are playing out in the media very much. So thank you thanks very much. Thanks so much for having me, yeah.
And thank you for all for joining me today. And I'll see you in two weeks at the next five minute check-in. 